Hey, it's Dr. Nick with the ECG Academy, and this is number 500. Woohoo! I've been doing these chalk talks for 10 years now, and those of you who subscribe for a long time know that there's no two alike. I always try to pick a tracing that's unique, and so you'll generally find pearls in every single one. Anyway, this tracing is no different, and it's really crazy. We have three leads, V1, lead 2, and V5. And as we glance across the strip, we see it's irregular, with fast and slow and all over the place, and there's no pattern to it. So we're going to call it irregularly irregular. And if we look at the long R to R intervals, that's where we can see what the atria are doing. And we can see very rapid signals here. Now, some people would be tempted to call this atrial flutter, but it's not because it's not consistent. You have very large looking waves here that are upright here and here. But when you come out here, we can't see the same kind of waves. So it's changing. Think of the difference between monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, where all the QRSs look the same, and polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, where all the QRSs look different. Well, that's the difference between atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. In atrial flutter, all the atrial events look the same whereas atrial fibrillation, they vary. So atrial fib is a polymorphic atrial arrhythmia, generally at a rate of above 300 beats per minute. And that's what we have here, is atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. But there's more to the story here because what you see here is a very large spike followed by a wide QRS complex. And so we also have a pacemaker operating here. So in fact, we have two pacemaker spikes in a row and they both capture the ventricle. And the first question in your mind should be, is this a single chamber or is it a dual chamber pacemaker? And can we tell? Well, it's useful to take out a pair of calipers at this point and bring it down to the spikes because if you find two spikes in a row, that tells you what rate the pacemaker is operating at. And if we bring this down to the grid, we can see that it's operating just a little bit faster than 100 beats per minute. It's not exactly 100 because this spike is almost on top of the red line, and this one is clearly a little to the left of it. So if it was a single chamber pacemaker, it would have to be operating at about 105 beats per minute, which would be very unusual now, wouldn't it? Why would a single chamber pacemaker be going at 105? Well, if it was a single chamber rate responsive pacemaker or rate adaptive pacemaker, what we refer to as VVIR, where the R means rate adaptive, you could get a lower rate limit of 105 beats per minute if the patient was on a treadmill walking at a fairly rapid rate. There the pacemaker pushes the heart rate up to 105 in order to provide the appropriate heart rate for someone who is exercising. But this is a patient lying there having a 12 lead ECG done. So rate adaptive pacing is highly unlikely in this case because the patient's obviously not on a treadmill. And so we have to figure this is a dual chamber pacemaker that is attempting to track this atrial arrhythmia because that's what dual chamber pacemakers do is when they see an atrial event, they're supposed to pace the ventricle synchronously with that event. Now, some pacemakers exhibit something called automatic mode switching. That's what Medtronic calls it. Other pacemakers do the equivalent, but essentially what happens is if the patient goes into atrial fibrillation, the atrial lead gets turned off, and instead what happens is the pacemaker switches to a VVIR mode. But that doesn't look like what's happening here. It looks like the pacemaker is trying to keep up with this atrial arrhythmia, so it's pacing at a rapid rate. But that's not what it's supposed to do. Tracking atrial fibrillation like this just leads to inappropriately rapid pacing, and it's not the way pacemakers are supposed to work. So that's one issue with this ECG that you should recognize. Not only that, but there's another serious problem that I see. First of all, what is this spike doing here? That is clearly a pacemaker spike. It looks exactly like these other two. Now you might say, gee, well, maybe it's trying to track the atrial fibrillation. But the problem is that you have this R wave right here. So why should the pacemaker pace so soon after that R wave? If the pacemaker was operating normally, that R wave initiates a refractory period known as the postventricular atrial refractory period or PVARP. What the pacemaker is trying to do is avoid sensing P waves right after a QRS complex because in someone who's in a normal sinus rhythm, if you pace in the ventricle, you could potentially get a retrograde P wave that lands right on the ST segment. And you don't want to track that because it can wind up causing problems. So 
in every single pacemaker, there is a programmable period of time after every R wave where the atrial lead will not track any P wave. And that period is known as the postventricular atrial refractory period. We call it PVARP for short. Then it means that that pacemaker might have seen a P wave, but did not see the QRS complex. Because if it didn't see the QRS complex, then the PVARP would not get started, and then it would be able to pace. But see, this is a sign of ventricular undersensing. Think of it this way. A normal pacemaker function, and after a period of time, you'll see a spike. And so there's an appropriate period of time after an intrinsic beat where a pacemaker will kick in. Now, what happens in the case of oversensing is that something occurs in this period of time, some noise or something that's inappropriately sensed by the pacemaker. And so it delays the spike. And as a result, you get an interval that's longer than you expect. Conversely, if you have undersensing, what happens is the pacemaker fails to sense an intrinsic beat and paces too soon because the pacer interval is sort of based on the previous beat. So it senses this one, but did not sense this one. Now, to keep those straight, I tell people, think of it this way. If the interval preceding the spike is longer than you expect, it's over the time interval that you're looking for, then that tells you it's over sensing. Whereas if the interval is under the time that you expect, if it's shorter, then it's under sensing. Get it? So if you see that the interval is under what you think it is, then it must be under sensing. And if it's over what you think it is, then it's over sensing. Okay, so it's easy to see right here that there's some kind of under sensing going on because you have this ventricular spike that doesn't belong there. You don't want to be pacing on top of the T wave. I mean, after all, if that pacer spike lands on a T wave and causes a very early PVC, it can cause trouble. So there's clearly ventricular under sensing going on And not only that, but this dual chamber pacemaker is misbehaving because it's attempting to track the underlying atrial fibrillation. Now, there are three more things I'd like to point out on this strip. First of all, notice that this QRS complex is very wide because it was fully paced, but this QRS complex was less wide. It's more narrow and looks a little bit more like the intrinsic QRS complexes that come down through normal conduction. So what do we call this kind of a beat? It's called a fusion beat because part of the QRS comes from the intrinsic conduction system, but the pacemaker spike was able to capture a portion of the ventricle. So some of it is coming from the conduction system and some of it is coming from the pacemaker wire and the two signals fuse together, creating a QRS that's sort of in between the fully paced wide QRS and a conducted narrow QRS. So that's known as a fusion beat. But what about this beat here? Look at that. There's a pacemaker spike on this beat, but this QRS complex looks exactly the same as all the other QRS complexes. So the pacemaker spike really did not contribute anything. It didn't really capture a significant amount of the myocardium. The pacemaker didn't see the QRS, so it paced on time, but the his bundle had already fired and the QRS was already well on its way to being inscribed through the normal conduction system. So what do we call this? This is not a fusion beat. We call it a pseudo-fusion beat. Pseudo, of course, meaning false. So it's really not a fusion beat. It just looks like it might be a fusion beat, but it's not. It's pseudo-fusion. Of course, that's a complete waste of energy. But again, what we're talking about is one of these fibrillation waves must have gotten sensed by the pacemaker and the pacemaker tried to pace in the ventricle, but the AV node had already passed the signal down, and so it really didn't accomplish anything. Well, the last thing I want to point out is here in V1, these first two beats. Look at that. They're wide, but they're not paced. They have a rabbit ear RSR prime appearance in V1 and a wide S wave in V5, and they're very rapid. So this is just a rate-related right bundle branch block aberrancy. So it's a functional bundle branch block because of the rapid rate.
but I'm just trying to show you how you can pick out so many interesting findings on one simple strip. But definitely pacemaker rhythms are some of the most complicated ones. And even most doctors have difficulty identifying all these types of abnormalities. So I hope that was helpful to you. I am hoping that by the end of this year, I'm going to be doing another live ECG masterclass on pacemaker rhythm strips doing a deep dive into how pacemakers actually work and all these refractory periods, how pacemakers behave with rapid rates and things like that. So happy 500 Chalk Talk. Woohoo! I'll have to pop open a bottle of bubbly. Until next time, this is Dr. Nick with the ECG Academy. Thanks for subscribing.